for the agent to to f focus on that. They have so many other things they're they're doing often with new work. So so that's one reason it's it's good to be published. I guess the other thing is though that uh, there are, the reading copies exist so that on Amazon.com you will you could look up a play of mine or a play by somebody else and you could get the Samuel French version which is cheaper than the, if you have, are lucky enough to have a, 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 a full published, you know, regular paperback, you can get the acting edition to read it. And uh, I know with my royalties, I will sometimes see, uh, oh, this is just for reading. This is what people pay to buy the, uh, um, this play service from Samuel French. And then copyright is a, is a confusing thing. Um, I remember when I started out, I always thought that you had to register your, play with a copyright and then I was later told no uh, once you've written it it's considered copyrighted automatically I mean I guess the only problem is if somebody later says I didn't write it and that when the play is published in my case at least uh, you, and, uh, anyway the, the publisher will, will do the copyright for you in your name so Yeah, since you brought Neil Simon, uh, his collection is his second plays. I think it's titled uh, The uh, Playwright is Schizophrenic. I don't know if you, you know that. Yeah. Where he talks about the characters in his plays actually make a whole person. Uh, <laughs> and the, you know, the, the, in a comedy, the best comic characters make parts of individuals. I don't know if you have any comment on that or not. It, what, was that the title of a, a grouping of his plays, well, or did he write an essay? The, the, the introduction, yeah, the essay. The oh, introduction, I see. Introduction I the see. Collection. Well, you know, uh, in in truth, I don't think I feel that way. But I wonder if he uh, feels that he put different sections of his own personality in his characters, maybe, which which it might it might be because I'm sort of aware that. Um, uh, for instance, in my early days, I wrote an awful lot of absurdist plays, and I thought they were just coming from my brain, because, you know, Edith Fromage said she invented cheese, and um, <laughs> crazy things like that. But as I grew older, and also started to write slightly more realistically, I realized that I was writing about my family of origin, even though the, the characters were crazy, because Edith Fromage, for instance, is very dominating, and she's telling Jane that what Jane sees isn't true, which is making Jane go crazy. And that kind of thing happened in my mother's family, uh, in my opinion. Um, so, but it was all unconscious. Uh, uh, so I feel like I, and, and then another thing that I often have, and I wonder if I should at least consciously change this for once or twice, but oftentimes the the voice of reason in some of my plays is a woman. And uh, like uh, Prudence in Beyond Therapy or uh, Felicity in Why Torture is Wrong and, other, and, and the people who love them. Um, and I, my mother had a, couple, a number of sides to her. Uh, she had a great, wonderful sense of humor. Um, she was uh, sometimes terribly stubborn. But in her family, she was the truth teller. And they didn't like her for being a truth teller. And she would, you know, <laughs> say, "What well, did you just have a vodka? Uh, you know, which they didn't want to be asked. And um, <laughs> so she wasn't very diplomatic, but she, she actually gave me, oh, I, once I got a, when, Wendy was wonderful getting me jobs. And I needed a summer job. And one of them she got me was to index a book on, on schizophrenia. And I learned the word reality testing, which I hadn't known, but it means that, you know, growing up, you want to know what's real and what's, what's true. And my mother really gave me a good reality testing with her family. So, because I, I, the fighting was upsetting. On the other hand, I knew that people weren't in agreement. So it meant you had to sort of think, well, you know, who's right? So, um, Anyway, that's sort of an eccentric answer to your question. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I take that? You know, I, I, uh, I tried to be more diplomatic because I had to live there. And so I would, when my mother would argue with my father when he was drinking, 
My father I, is nice, especially as I grew older. I, I saw his niceness. My mother liked him too, but they did fight and he did drink. And, um, but she would fight with him when he was drunk. And, uh, and I would just say to her over and over, and sorry when I was 10, or, uh, you know, don't wait until the morning. Don't, don't yell at him when he's drunk. And she would agree and then disobey immediately. <laughs> so, disobey. So, um, so I, but you know, in my head I took sides because I basically said that my mother was a truth teller. So I, I did at some point go, you know, she's right about these things she said. Okay. Uh, a question. Um, a lot of your shorter plays have very kid-friendly vocabulary, and it's easy, and it can be read in the classroom. Then other plays, obviously, we can't even open it. It's really totally censored. We're talking Hardy Boys, and you know that one, and so forth. <laughs> how do you? What's your inspiration for that? Like, how do you decide? Okay, today I'm going to write a play that has no bad words whatsoever. This one's going to have everything, but you know. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't make a decision. Um, uh, I think that some of my earlier plays were uh, shocking. Yeah. Uh, the one I got into yell with was called The Nature and Purpose of the Universe, and it was very dark and violent, but I think funny. But um, um, And then I, I, my play Titanic, which I wrote the time I was at Yale, uh, is really my craziest play, and it's, it's very risque and, and crazy. And um, however, then other times, like when I, Actors Nightmare was written, because, which is done in high schools a lot, and actually I love it when, when high school teachers tell me that they teach it because there are parodies of Noel Coward and Shakespeare and um, Beckett. And I think, well, what a fun way to get into teaching other, uh, and I love all those writers. But um, uh, when Sister Mary was done as a one act, and it ran for three weeks and got great reviews and, and so on. Um, then uh, we had some people trying to raise money for our Broadway, but they just couldn't manage to. Uh, they were young and starting out. And uh, So then my agent was good friends with Andre Bishop, who was running Playwrights Horizons. And she, she said to Andre, would you ever do Sister Mary again? And he said, yes, but I, it, I feel it needs a curtain raiser. Um, Sister Mary's about an hour and 10 minutes. and. Um, he felt that that was too short. Um, the plays have gotten shorter in recent years. But in any case, so I, I actually tried three different plays, and Actors Nightmare was the third. The first one, I tried Identity Crisis, which already existed, but to have Sister, the actress playing Sister do Edith Fromage, that was two strong women, and it was redundant somehow. And then the next one was the first act of Baby with the Bathwater, which was originally a one act, and it ends with them shaking. A toy, a poison toy at the the baby. Um, uh, they're not aware it's poison, but everything about this baby's upbringing is terrible. And my friend uh, Walter Bobby, who was an actor at the time, is now a very good director, said to me, "That's not a curtain raiser. That's a curtain downer." <laughs> so I was on vacation once, and I. Just a strange thing. I, I had a nightmare. It wasn't even an actor's nightmare, but. I thought to myself, oh wow, I was just thinking about all those times I've dreamt that I've, uh, in a play and I haven't been in rehearsal and I don't know why and you're, you're on stage and you have to make it up or something. <laughs> and um, and I've had that dream many times. So I decided that might be a good idea to write a play. And uh, and I wrote it on vacation and it meant that the, the private lives and the Beckett stuff were all in my head. Because actually much of the lines were correctly in my head and not the Beckett so much as the thing. The Shakespeare I had to leave blank till I got home, but um, uh, so it wasn't really a deci decision. It was just that because of the plays that they were in, uh, there wasn't any uh, out there sexual stuff or something. Uh, I've been a little surprised <laughs> at some of the plays of mine that uh, high schools do. Um, I can't think of what the examples are offhand, but uh, they're they're. They use some of the more, but certainly the Hardy Boys, for instance, is often done. And, and by the way, it's sort of slightly naughty, but not super naughty. <laughs> anyway, so it's not a choice, it's just sometimes. Uh... And you know, I'm probably a little more aware of it now that I'm older than I was when I was in my 20s, too, about being careful when to. Oh, I know the one that's surprising they must do in high school. Naomi, Naomi in the living room. She does, she has the most out there. Uh, 
she's always talking in uh, inappropriately uh, bad words. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I, as someone who obviously has had a long career and is still going on, um, I am curious as to what you, you know, how you've seen, I guess, theater evolve in your career, um, and um, I guess where you see theater now as far as how it fought. This is crazy general, and I don't mean it to be, but I don't know how to make it specific. But like, you know, how you see it, um, I guess, how you see its purpose, and do you feel it's a positive? Theater is in a positive place because everybody's always saying what's dying is dying. They've been saying that for years. And as someone who's really been involved for so many years, where do you see it functioning? You know, in our in our culture, in our society, and if it's positive, you think still. The short answer is I think it's still positive. Uh, I think financially it's very difficult right now, but for everybody and for the people running theaters. Um, um, I feel like uh, I feel two things about the question. One is that I feel I feel like um, even when I was in high school, there would be articles in the New York Times: "Is, is theater dead?" That so that they just ask it so many times, and it, it doesn't seem to be gone. Um, and then uh, again, I want to refer back to your key, keynote when you were just saying if you've been. Uh, moved by something in a special way that actually does have to do with the exchange between the human actors and the words of the play and you being there. And it really does vary sometimes. I mean, as an actor, I know it sometimes varies from performance to performance. There's some performances that are oddly magical and then others, you can't force it. But um, I saw uh, Sherry Orchard is one of the few Chekhov plays uh, I've not seen much. I, I've seen many of the others repeated times. And so there was a recent production uh, at CSC that, that Diane Weist was, I loved it too, I was glad you did. Anyway, I, I went to see, I had rented two, two BBC versions uh, from Netflix uh, that were stage things, and, and Judy Dench was in both. She was the lead in, in the, when she was older, and she was the young daughter earlier, and Peggy Ashcraft, uh, Ashcroft was the, um, the lead. And they were good, but I don't know, they're a little musty. Um, the only one who wasn't musty was John Gilwood is the f brother. He was fabulous. But the other people, mm, I don't know. But so I went really never having seen a, a live production. And um, well, you know how tricky it is to make Chekhov funny. Um, and in the two BBC versions, when, when they come in and, and uh, uh, Madame Ryaskaya uh, has, is not paying not be, paying her bills and is not paying attention. It wasn't funny in the BBC ones. And when Diane Weiss came in, she, she just looked at the bill and she threw it on the ground in this way that was funny. It was, uh, but at the same time, you I don't know. And the brother was not facing things in ways that were funny. Uh, and I I just felt very um, uh, I felt very entranced by this this particular production or then to jump back I was telling you and maybe somebody else about when I saw Cloud Nine in uh, off Broadway in the 80s and it, it had a play a production by Tommy Toon and I really enjoyed it and Act Two the ending was so unexpectedly moving I just uh, was so taken by that, I, I saw it five times, and uh, uh, not close together, but over a, a year and a half or something, and the first three times, E. Catherine Kerr, who won an O before it, would, had the final speech that was so moving, and then later I befriended her, and she was in my play Laughing Wild. Um, so I, I feel that, I, I, like 25 years ago, I decided that theater wasn't going to die. It might get small, it might, but, but I just think that there's something about the live experience that actually is good. Now you can go to a live experience and be bored, and so that's not good, but, but you know, it's like making a meal that's not so good. You can't always control it. <laughs> I think it will go on. Thank you very much. You've been uh, generously uh, sharing wisdom all day. And then...
Molly Carl and Mr. Gray so much and all of the presenters who um, moderated and presented